Welcome to the Institute for Human Centered Design's webcast uh, featuring Anna Herringer and her extraordinary tale of architecture as a tool to improve lives. Very specifically, we're going to be talking about an arc of a designer's life that started when she traveled to Bangladesh at 19 and met Dipshaka, the, the nonprofit uh, sustainable development non company that is so much this story. So this is, this is a, 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 an experience in two parts. We, um, we want to be able to share the story and create a context through a two minute video, which will have only traditional music from uh, Bangladesh and extraordinary images of both uh, the materiality, the environment of the An Anandaloid project, and loads of pictures of people both in process and at the end. Um, and let me introduce Anna a little more fully. Many of you are aware of Anna as somebody who is making a significant um, a significant identity internationally um, in her vision around sustainable architecture, architecture um, that is transformative for people. Um, she has um, she has been a recent recipient of the 2020 Obel Award. Uh, she has previously uh, 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 an Aga Khan Award. Um, she has been a Harvard uh, Loeb Fellow at the GSD. She has had a Royal Institute of British Architects International Fellowship. Um, and she is deeply grounded for all these awards and all this accolade. Uh, Anna is somebody who has a vision of what architecture can do. I think the overarching story out of this is partly a sense of great possibility, but also a sense of the joy available through participatory design. So I will have, uh, let me just let Anna's video uh, open and create a two minute context before Anna actually speaks to you personally. And I just wanna express our deep appreciation, not only for Anna's time and investment, um, but for the wonderful participation of our panel, which will include several people from Dipshaka, uh, people who are deeply involved in this building and know it intimately. Uh, so this is a, it's a great opportunity for us. And we have a colleague and architect from Nigeria who is an affiliate of IHCD who will also be joining us. So that's the panel at the end. So first video and then Anna with a, with a PowerPoint presentation and then the panel. Your questions and answers will be welcome um, at the end for the panel, but you can put them in at any time. So warm, warm thanks for coming and enjoy this experience. Tomar gore bosho tkare koi 
Yes, good evening, everyone. Namaskar to Bangladesh. Slama alaikum. I'm very happy to have my Deepshika family also here with me today. I'm going to share my lecture. One second. So. Yes, for me, architecture is really a tool to improve lives. I really strongly believe in that. It's, you know, we have great uh, power and responsibility in our hands to, to not just leave a bad impact imprint on the environment, but really to add to social justice, to a cultural diversity, and of course, also to keep our planet safe for the future generations. I'm teaching at various universities and that picture shows a study trip uh, with my students from Zurich and that day that picture was taken on a day in the end of October in the mountains of Austria of Vorarlberg and it was really cold and I surprised the group with the fact that I had not booked a hotel or a hut or any sort of accommodation for them but it was the challenge for these architecture students to build their shelter, their house for, for one night with whatever they could find. And that of course was quite a challenge. It was, you know, in Switzerland, you get the outdoor freaks who are saying, yeah, we're gonna build a hut and we are even, you know, we are allowed to sleep there. Then there was like another part of the group was thinking, yeah, there must be a plan B. There must be somehow a sort of hotel in the background, but there was not. And then the third part was just utterly shocked about the challenge and it was really cold. The um, huts or shelters really did not very look very luxurious. That was one group. Um, and I have to say I also was fr freezing like anything in the night, but it was such a great learning experience that in fact, there are a lot of resources given by nature for free. And all we need is our sensitivity to see these resources and our creativity to use them. And that I had learned also in my year as a volunteer with Dipshika as a development learner. I was 19 when I first went to Bangladesh as a really uh, fresh from, from school. I had no idea <laughs> um, about any sort of profession that time. So I was really just there for learning. And what I learned from Dipshika was that the most effective and resilient strategy for, for development always is to look at the resources that you have available and make the best out of those and not get depending on, on external factors. So Dipshika was actually founded by, by the father of Chokodish, who is also joining us today. And, you know, just a villagers, a teacher, and Chokodish father um, was Nibaron, was a, a teacher there. So it was really the idea came, originated in Bangladesh, which, which was, I think, very important. And I was there, of course, as a foreigner, but I was, was the one who really wanted to learn how the Bangladeshi perspective on life is and, and what, what, you know, what also me as a German can learn from that perspective. And then several years later in 2004, when I did my diploma project in architecture, I tried to convert these lessons that I learned from Dipshik and the philosophy into, into architecture. And in terms of material, I didn't have to look far. They were just right under my feet. It was the mud, the dirt, the clay, the earth, however you call it, and the bamboo that was just growing all around. And um, so local materials are always essential for me. And along with that, local energy resources. And when we think of alternative energies, we always think of solar, wind, and so on. But we also have a human energy. And that is a very important source of energy. And furthermore, you know, we are growing world population. And we, if we don't use this power, this energy, we also create social problems. So for me, um, you know, base, um, having the, the process based on this human energy is for me a very essential part also in order to create work. Because that really contributes also to social justice. And um, well, two is one issue too, but we had these guys, water buffaloes, altogether eight. <laughs> I was a very proud owner of water buffaloes. Interestingly, we had also tested the mixing uh, with the cows, but they were too intelligent. They were, would always step in the, in the hoof holes of the previous round, while the water buffaloes didn't get the trick, and they were just mixing the straw and the water and the mud, which are the ingredients of the mix. 
And then by hand, this mix is put on top of a foundation, in that case uh, of a brick foundation, and then cut with a spade into an accurate shape, as you can see here. Oh, sorry, that sound should not be so. So you cut it just like, like in an accurate shape and then, you know, the leftovers, the things that fall down, you just use in the next mix again. And so the building is growing from, from one layer to the next layer without any formwork. And after six months of construction period with a little a gap in between, the school looked like this. So you had like really load bearing earth walls, massive walls of about half a meter thickness that really ground the school. And then you have like a power post, like the, the, the bamboo structure in, on top of it that is kind of a little bit, um, yeah, like a power pose. <laughs> and, and you have a rhythmic in this building, so it's not following in a grid system and it has a lot of colorful doors. And the ground floor, we kept the tradition in, in, in Rutepur and in, in, in the rural parts of Bangladesh, which was also um, the, the idea and the wish from Paul Jawatika, who founded that school, the Meiji school, and he wanted to have it really rooted in the local tradition as well. So we kept the tradition, we have a very neutral classroom and then through this little round hole in the back wall that you see, it, we come into the cave area. And the briefing of, of Paul Ticker was, you know, I want to have a school where children enjoy learning, where they really like to be in. So I was trying to, to remember the spaces that I loved when I was a kid. And I think a Bavarian kid or a German kid is not much different from a child in Bangladesh. I think, <laughs> I think that's just a, an archaic and general phenomena that, you know, this kind of cave-like spaces, we feel just protected in it. But not just, you know, completely and, and, you know, being in a cave, but still having an overview of things that are going on. So you could literally sit in the, in the cave room, but you still have the, connect, the connection, the visual connection to what's going on the in the classroom. So the idea was, because the different speed of, of the children, of the students in, in doing tasks is respected. So when children are are faster in doing a work that just can grab a book and instead of disturbing the others that are maybe not yet done with the work they can go to the cave area and do their own things or it's also you, you know you could also split up the group and do some some teamwork sessions in the different corners and and, and caves and of course um, it's also very highly used for for playing and the the top floor is more the tree house element it's another archaic pattern that I think goes, goes that is not related to any culture. I think that is also very much embedded in our, you know, in our human memory. And it's, it has this kind of shades from the bamboos when the sunlight is coming through this um, uh, bamboo shutters. And then you have a lot of colors under the ceiling with this extremely beautiful sari clothes that the women in Bangladesh are wearing and sometimes in in their own homes you see the saris on top of their bed under the ceiling so I just took the elements that I found in the village and just used it in a different scale and in a different way but it's it's the elements itself are all kind of coming from from the village itself the inspirations and here you see that the children all signed with their names in Bengali at the doors and they're rightfully signed because they also have building the school. So that was for me a very essential element that the users will be included in the process. And you cannot do this with every material, but with mod you can do it. I think you all remember how it feels when you have your hands in the clay. It's just a wonderful feeling. And normally the, the, the Métis school kids, they have this kind of clay works, pottery works in the afternoon. So they had pottery in a large, uh, in, a, in a slightly larger scale. But it was, I, for me, it was so important to have them included because I think, you know, everyone wants to be needed, no matter how strong you are or how big and tall you are. And we had really people from, you know, very old age included. We had the kids included. We had people with disabilities included. We had, of course, not in that building, but in the next one, we had also women involved. So we just, you know, we, we, we have the tendency in, in our society that we amuse the kids 
aside from real life and then they have this plastic kitchen and they have this plastic um, construction tools and then they play like um, play con construction site but in real they, they want to be part of this thing and and that was possible because the clay you can really use your hands you don't have to have tools to do that that could eventually harm you so um that that just enabled that material enabled a lot of inclusion what i love a lot on this on this material and i think you can all imagine how it feels then in the end when you stand as a small boy or girl in front of that school building after six months and you know that you built this building with your own hands only your own hands and the dirt underneath your feet that's just such an incredible boost of your own confidence of your self-confidence in your own resources confidence in team and also confidence in the local materials because especially mod has a very mod bamboo but especially mod has a generally around the world a very bad image which is sad because Earth, earthen walls can stand there for a long time, even hundreds of years, if you follow certain rules. And the first rule is a good foundation. The second rule is a good roof so that the water cannot penetrate from the ground or the top into the walls. And third rule is erosion control. So just like a hill, you know, if a hill doesn't have trees or rocks, then there is a lot of a, a, a fast pace of water flowing down, floating down the river, and then you have a lot of erosion. So you need speed breakers and those speed breakers could be lines of horizontal lines of, of mortar or bricks, or in that case, it's bamboo shindles. And then also on the level of the mix, you need to have some rough elements in like stones or, or in that case, straw because Bangladesh has almost no stones. So then the surface gets a little bit rough and this roughness is all you need to, to prevent the water from running down in a fast pace. And furthermore, there is a kind of a crystallization process. After like four years, I noticed that the walls became outside incredibly hard. And it's because the mud is breathing the, the, the humidity, very breathing it in and breathing it out in a very fast pace. And through this constant breathing, there's a kind of natural crystallization process happening on the facade. And that makes the walls really strong. So I don't add any cement in the walls, only in the foundation, because mud is the only material if you use it in an unstabilized way that you can take from the ground you can repair it you can recycle it as often as you want without any loss of quality and you can return it back to nature and plant your garden on top so it's really a wonderful circle of nature that would just be hampered you know if you add some ingredients inside that just you know harm the natural cycles and furthermore it's not needed when you just respect the certain rules to deal with, with this vulnerability. So this is how the Meta School looks like now. So it's like we built it 2005. So 15 rainy seasons with sometimes really harsh horizontal monsoon rays and the walls are still standing strong. And in terms of economic sustainability for me, the interesting thing was that, I mean, because I was living also in Rotopur, I often went with the workers with the bicycle to the nearest market and I could see how they immediately spent the, the building budget, you know, the wages that they got every day. So I could see that, you know, the daily, the daily wage went into the vegetables of the, of the neighbor or in, to the tailor who got a new sari blouse or a new haircut. So the building budget was, was just not, it was not just a building the result, but the building budget was also a catalyst for, for development, for local development. And that was for me the, the best part. And and if I had built the, the school with bricks or cement and, and steel, this money would have been gone and lost for this society or for, for these people. It would have been exported and went into the pockets of some industrial um, <laughs> men or women, but it would have been lost for the community there. So for me, that's the, the best part as an architect to say, you know, the outcome is not just a building, but it's also a catalyst for development. If we not just design a building, but also the process. And because the Meta School got several awards, we were able also to build the second building, the Deshi building. It's an electrical vocational training center and it hosts like the classrooms uh, and also apartment for, for teachers. So for me, the most important part of this project was that we go in a two-story way 
And um, because mod is more durable than bamboo, we went two story with the mod. And Bangladesh has really a scarcity of, man, uh, of land because it's so highly, so densely populated. So, but still in most of the rural areas, people go and expand in a horizontal way in, in, in single stories. So it was for me very important to say, well, it's actually possible to add just one room on top and you save the land, you know, if, I mean, it's maybe not much for one building, but if the millions of Bangladeshi who are living in single story units in, in the rural areas would do that, that would set free a lot of resources, land resources to cultivate food. And another thing that was important for that Deshi building was that we tried to, to refine the craftsmanship even further because also, you know, plastic buckets and so on from China getting cheaper than baskets. So we wanted to do basket weaving in a, in a different scale. So taking what we find and, and just doing it a little bit different. And that's the, the um, veranda behind this kind of bamboo woven ornamental pattern. And what you see here is you have the sardis again from the top, the light is filtering through it. It has some, you know, some patched shadows, which is very comfortable, psychologically very comfortable if you don't have the bright sunlight or the shadow, but if you have the spaces in between and the shades in between, and then you have the shades of, of the ornaments that go through these bamboo weaving patterns uh, on the ground. And it's a space that is um, used in, in a lot of ways, um, could be for fitness <laughs> for the class, could be as a workspace for the teachers or drying the laundry and whatever. So it's very much similarly used also as the courtyards in, in the traditional homesteads. These were the drawings. So I started the, the, the building with just a feeling in my belly how it could look like. So there were no elevations or sections when we started the building. And it was interesting to know, to, to experience that you can actually trust on your gut feeling and your intuition. And um, because the team was, was very similar or the same, mostly the same, like the Metis school. So we knew each other really well. And because I was always on site, I, it was like a very much organic process. I knew when I can step back and give more space to the workers and when I have to step in again, you know, to get the proportions right and so on and, and the functions. So it was a very inclusive process, uh, which was for me the, the most wonderful thing because a lot, of, a lot of the design decisions just happened on the site while talking to each other. That was the team that time. Um, Montoram Shaw, who is also now the contractor of the Ananda Loy building that I will show very soon. Then Stefan Neumann, the engineer um, from Germany and Kondaka Hasebul Kobe with his students. So we also had students from Bangladesh um, with us in the team and also students from, from um, Base Habitat from Austria who also had running their own sites with, with, um, with farmer families in, in the village. Women on the site was something that I was trying very hard at the Metis school to get them in, but the workers said, you know, no, our, our wives don't work on, on site. It's not, not our tradition. So I just ate it. I just accepted it. But then on this, on the Deshi building site, um, because we had some, some Bangladeshi students, female students with us that were really beautiful. So the flirt level was also quite high on, on, on the site. And I realized when I was walking through the village that the wives of the workers were not happy. And then I, I stopped and stopped, started talking to them, said, you know, um, how can we solve that? Would you like to come on the site, be part of this? Would you like to work on the site? And they said, yeah, but we can't really imagine what we could do, what we're able to do. And then we just discussed. And while discussing, we figured out that traditionally the plastering is done by women. And I said, well, we can't use the, 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 the you know, the trays and, and the tools and everything, but we could do it with the hand. And so yeah, it's even more beautiful. So they, they said, okay, hired. Next day you come. And then they said, yes, but please um, don't tell anything to our husbands. And I said, no, no work. So next, next morning at seven o'clock, the workers came and five past seven, their wives appeared on site. And of course, first the faces were long and like mm, the fun is over. And they were kind of, disappointed but after a week or so they started flirting with their own wives 
because just the mood on the site was 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 open and they were you know you work hand hand in hand on the site uh, and of course you queue for the same amount of money in the end of the day and it's so much more the team spirit that it fostered also through the sites so it was also had really an effect on on the families and this film click is something that is really touching me every time i see it it's a scenery when you pass you know when you leave taka city you have to cross a belt of of chimneys and and brick fields where they take this wonderful raw material earth and clay and put a lot of carbon emissions in it to make it a better building material for me it's not a better building material because brick is not as suitable for this humid climate than the clay because it cannot breathe out and breathe in this humidity as fast as the clay. So for me, it's really heartbreaking to see, you know, what kind of CO2, how many, how vast amounts of CO2 is kind of pumped in the air. And it's actually not needed because we would just need our, our know-how to apply on this wonderful raw material and could make the, the buildings just as good or even better with just, you know, not adding all these carbon emissions. This is the, the last building uh, we did uh, together with Dipshika in, in, in Rudapur. It's the Ananda Loy building. Ananda means um, deep felt joy. And the idea originated from Dipshika and the Kandore Foundation in Hong Kong, um, who visited the, 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 uh, the, the village. And I think Shoponda or, or <laughs> Or Jogadish, that you will explain a bit how you, you got to the idea later. But I got the phone call from Dipshika and asking me if I would like to do the structure. And I was, of course, very happy to do the structure. So it was clear that this uh, building is going to be a center for people with disabilities. And because I know that the effort in, in doing a building, you know, and, and the whole communication and the traveling and everything, is is quite quite a lot i thought it would be good to to add another story and and you know use it in more extended way so that you know um it's not just a, a single story building and it was also it was also a wish to say you know this is not an exclusive building only for people with disabilities but it's it's something you know it's just a, a place of joy and where everyone finds finds a good, a good corner and a good niche and, and, and feels well. So unlike the other buildings that are kind of a straight box, I wanted this building to dance, you know, to really say, okay, we, it's good that we are not all just um, following the norm or, you know, the normality. It's good that we have a diversity and it's something beautiful and something to celebrate. And that is what this building kind of wants to transmit. So when you approach the building, the first, the first thing is you see a ramp, you know, that winds up and really dances around the structure. And it's the only ramp in that area. And the first thing people, you know, ask when they come to the site is why there is a ramp? And then immediately you are right at the center of the discussions on on you know universal uh, universe, um, universal and and inclusive architecture you know and buildings and why it is important that everyone has access and and that was a, a wonderful experience to see that architecture actually can transmit a lot of a lot of um, philosophy already through through the design so here you see the therapy room with the thick earth walls and the bamboo and palm tree ceiling and an earth floor and painted doors. And here you see the ramp gliding up the, the, the first floor. And for me, it's funny because I'm, I'm, I'm a very impatient person, unfortunately. And I'm always taking two steps, you know, when I'm going a, a staircase because I just want to go up fast. And I, and, I, and I actually planned a staircase, a shortcut in the middle, because I thought it will be so annoying for the people to go up the ramp. But in fact, I love to go up the ramp in the slowest way, because it's like, because probably be, also because the, the ramp is built out of clay, it's just so soft, you, you know, you move your 
body around the structure and then you have all these different views on this beautiful landscape and it's just such a joy to walk to walk up to glide up this you, you really feel like gliding up the ramp and i think it has to do a lot with also with the softness of the materiality and under the ramp you have the caves area and unlike the meta school you can really enter directly from the ground to the caves area and it takes an effort to go there and i think that's quite quite good because it could be used also as, as part of the therapy you know you have to you have to make an effort to go so you have to physically wind yourself i mean there are several several um accesses to that cave but for once for some you really have to have an effort to, to climb in and it's also a bit of course a kid's space you know it's because adults for adults it's more difficult to go inside but it's you know when you have to reach something you know you can you can directly um, go from the floor there but it's it's something you know it's not you don't walk inside this thing with your head up high so you have to change the perspective and and then you end up in in a small little uni universe you know it's completely different the, the, the space is there and it's of course a space that is very much loved by by the kids uh, that i heard yesterday from from the therapist from johnny who's joining us later too so it's it's also a space you know where you can meet you know where 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 you can where also children meet maybe kids with disabilities where you can um you know and it's a different it's a, it's a different zone it's a different universe it's different here and it's but it's it's very beautiful and i think that's also a nice symbol and also i my idea was also behind sometimes you may may have a therapy session where you just overhand and you don't want anymore and then you just you know go down and 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 crawl into the cave and and maybe the the, the therapist cannot follow you because it's you know it's you know you're hidden and i think that is maybe some sometimes also good you know if if you have a a space where you can hide away and be on your own and have your own little universe and that is the top floor which is Dip the textiles that's a women's cooperative that i started together with dipshika and veronica langer taylor in my hometown laufen and we started this project because you know, when you're such a long time in Bangladesh, you can't look away from the government sector and how the government sector is really shaping the settlement patterns in Bangladesh. So it's not planners that are actually shaping the spaces. It's much more the government sectors because the government sector is dragging the labor force all from all around Bangladesh into certain centers and hubs. And there, you know, there accumulating the people in such high numbers that there is just not enough resources for for humane conditions there anymore so my original idea was how is it possible to bring you know to turn it upside down to bring the work to the people because when you are living in the village you know you can build your house with your own hands with the family from the resources you find for free you can have a little house garden you can have a goat and chicken you can, you know, the children have the most wonderful playground, which is the entire village, is a healthy air. And um, you don't need to spend money much on transportation because you have everything, you know, is just in walking distance. And you're not so much depending on electricity because there is already so much, you know, amusement is happening just because you talk with people and you have this beautiful landscape and, and the family bonds. So you're much more independent also because as a woman you know the network you know the village so you can move freely around well when you end up in this textile hubs you don't know anyone and you're just not walking around so you what what's left on freedom is that you stare in your tv for the remaining hours that you're awake and and then next morning you go again in the factory and this six times a, um, a week for at least 10 hours and we just wanted to to give work opportunities to women in the villages so that they don't have to leave the villages and they can really find work and we thought okay with my architecture i found i'm at the limits with my profession what i can do here but i can together with with veronica design a product that can be produced in a completely decentralized way and what you see here is a, an installation from the biennale 2018 in, in venice in italy 
where we showed this project as an architectural project, as a spatial project. And we say, you know, this is not just a shirt, this is a playground, this is a, a, mud, a beautiful mud house, this is, you know, this, we all create spaces through the way we consume and a lot with clothes. And we just, we are not aware of these spaces because they are so far away that we don't see them. But every shirt, everything that we buy, everything that got produced somewhere is creating a space somewhere else. And we did not, you know, in most of the cl clothes, we have spaces like this, we create spaces like this, which are absolutely not humane. And same as in architecture, where I'm trying to look what are the local potentials, what are the local resources, I did the same with the textiles. When we think of made in Bangladesh, we think of cheaply made t-shirts with various prints on it. But in fact, Bangladesh had such a rich culture of textiles. It was famous and still is famous for beautiful textiles. And, and I just, you know, our project is based on these textiles. And in, I don't know how it is in the US, but in Germany, uh, one person get, um, buys 60 clothes per year, 60, 60. And I mean, you can, you can do the, the maths, how often you can wear these 60 clothes per year. In Bangladesh, it's one, one sari, one lungi per, per person per year. And um, also when these when this cotton saris are worn out, they're not thrown apart, away, they're kept. And then when several layers are coming together, several saris, several lungis, lungis are the skirts of the man. Then they are just put in, in layers together. And then with lots of hand stitches, they are fixed together as blankets. And then people very often sleep on those blankets. So they have the straw underneath or some kind of futon. And then they sleep on this, on these blankets. And then you see, you know, with the peeling of the surfaces, with, you know, the moving in the night, the dreams, there's, there's kind of the, the next nuances and next layers of the, of the blankets are appearing on the surface and, and kind of blending into each other. So it's a kind of a full family history that is, is coming in, you know, is, is, is peeling off from, from, you know, from, from, you know, the, the longer they sleep on it. So you might remember, ah, this, 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 this kind of turquoise sari that was the time when I was pregnant with my first daughter on oh, this pink one, suddenly this kind of check, um, pattern is coming out ah that was the lungi where the water that was the year where the water buffalo stepped on the on my my husband's toes that was a very difficult year so it's really the whole family history is embedded in those in those blankets and then after a while before they are complete you know then they fall of course into pieces at one point and before they do this um the families bring it to our little um workshop to our tailoring workshop where the dipti textile women are, are making clothes out of them. And normally we send, you know, first we, we let normally get our, our clothes produced in, in countries like Bangladesh to labor costs that are absolutely unfair in conditions that are unfair. And then we wear them a couple of times and then we send it probably to some African markets where they are so cheap that also the local tailors, they don't get any job anymore. So we're destroying again a culture. So we thought we turn it we turn the thing upside down. We sent the old clothes from Bangladesh to a European or American or whatever market. And also as a sign, you know, that we reach um, a good living standard, not just, you know, by consuming more and more resources, new resources, but also by using existing resources and adding another layer of, of creativity, design and crafts on it. We also started to document all our building projects. That's of course the facade of the Metis School, the section of the Metis School, where we always really compose the, those in, in the existing patterns, those drawings on the existing patterns, that's the Deshi building. And it's, it's just so fascinating, you know, when, when our drawing and then the hand stitching of the women is kind of blending in and then the textiles, this beautiful textiles, it's, it's very vibrant surfaces. And here you see the master plan of the village and all this, these blue dots that you see here are actually the excava excavation sources for the mud. So, oop, so you, you would take the mud out of this pond and then build you know, the buildings out of it, the mud buildings out of it. And these, all these green parts are the bamboo that is growing around. And that's, you see that the, the, the building resources are so close by 
where they are actually needed. And then of course the food cultivation is also just so close by. So this kind of closeness of, of, of the circles of the materials is just um, so wonderful that that's why, why also Bangladesh has such a enormously small ecological footprint. And I think we can just learn enormously about the level of sustainability that they have. Yeah, it might not be in our focus, but about 3 billion people on this planet in every climate zone, in all cultures, are living in mud houses. And of course, this, these numbers are going down also because there are no architects and engineers who know how to build with these things. And you don't find it in the, in the journals and you don't find it in, in TV and in, it, in the advertisement. Because, you know, if you go on the highways in Bangladesh, for example, every five minutes you're hit by an advertisement for cement, for aluminum, for steel and so on. And air conditioning, of course, that comes along with that. So because there's a lack of education in tr and training and awareness of, of mod architecture, I brought the mod to Harvard. Precisely um, 60 tons of dirt right in front of the Greater School of Design. And uh, we got all together 150 people, students, professors, faculty members, people from Cambridge, also from MIT, Rhode Island University came together. And, and joined forces, also Martin Rauch, is, who is an expert in, in earthen structures and a colleague with whom I'm collaborating a lot, came over and then we transformed this rather cold space. Uh, maybe some of you know that space, which is windy, noisy and way too high. So the proportions are not very humane. So you just cross this place normally in a very fast way. But this, with this intervention, this place became really a place to, for people to gather. And you would find kids there, you would find, of course, skaters there, you would find elderly people taking a break there, professors, students, and sometimes even homeless people staying there overnight. So it was really a very special atmosphere. It was meant to be there for three weeks, it last, so they, they kept it for three months. And, and there are quite some voices that are missing this, this structure. It was built, I think, 2011. And for me, the interesting thing was to see that that so many people were constantly touching the wall. And the surprising thing was it, the, the clay in Boston is gray. So it looked like a concrete wall. It, visually, you couldn't make a difference. And still people were constantly touching the wall. And for me, that was, an, was just so clear that we, we are not perceiving materials just on a visual way. There is so much more senses involved in this thing, in, in, in materiality. And especially with the earth, it's not just a building material, it's an element. There's so many poems and myths and, you know, it's Mother Earth. So there's a very old connection between human beings and Earth. And I think this is kind of something that our, we just physically and, and also on a soul level, I think we connect with this, with this um, material and element. Yeah, I like this video a lot because of that scene, you know, there's a, a, a man coming by, hands in the pocket, and then the last moment he claps the, the mud wall. So it's, it's, and then another person just reading and leaning on, and again, like caressing the walls. And that I think is, you know, special because normally we don't go around our cities and, and caressing facades. So for scaling up, um, I also wrote a book together with Lindsay Blair Howe and Martin Rauch, you know, what is needed. And of course, education on all levels, craftsmen, architects, engineers, and um, or everyone involved in, in, in construction is needed. And of course, also technical development, such as prefabrication developed by Martin Rauch. So you, you have these blocks, rammed earth blocks, prefabricated in a long shattering. Then you cut this wall, this rammed earth wall into pieces. Those pieces could al already have like the insulation inserted and the electrical fitting and so on. And then, of course, you can staple them on the side, just as any other concrete wall, for example. And that's important because otherwise you couldn't scale up in urban processes because, of course, in, in Boston, for example, you can't rotate with the water buffaloes. And because the rammed earth is unstabilized, there's no cement added, you can just make the joints wet and then add the same material in the joints. And then in the end, in the end it looks completely monolithical again. And that's, for example, a modern earth factory in Austria from Erden, from Martin Rauch, where you can see the machine that is ramming this long wall and you see the, the dimension. So this is kind of the latest state of the art of, 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 of building 
um, that I think enables a lot of future usages. And along with the technical development, we also need good architectural examples that prove you can build with an old material still in a modern way. It's not a matter how old the material is. It's a matter of our creative ability to use it in a way that it meets the needs and aspiration of, of, of the people now. And this, for example, was a Bamba Biennale in China in, in the village Baosi, where it was about to show the, the beauty of bamboo. And the buildings have a core out of stone and rammed earth. And then the sleeping concorns attached to this structure. And they kind of gloom in the light like Chinese lampshades. And around the structure, you have a very um, loose bamboo weaving structure that is open and has this very specific shape, like big baskets they look in in in, in different shapes one uh, like one is a more a bit more spiky the other one is more roundish and the other one is very high like a big hut so um and it was wonderful to see how how also the people in the village could could take part in and the contractor of that site said normally he has to fly in the experts you know how to deal with this um this designs of architects and, and he said it's the first time that he could actually really hire people from the village. Yeah, and this picture is also something that really set me a bit under shock. It's like, you know, this, this, this just incredible scale of, of these growing cities in China. And when we see the numbers, it's between 2011 and 13, China has consumed more cement than the United States in the entire last century. So it's just, you know, the speed and the scale is just incredible. And if we think that these people, a lot of these people have built, have lived in, in, in houses built out of natural materials before, that's just a, a tendency and a trend that is, is, is difficult to take because we, if we all continue in that way, and of course, I mean, we did it in Europe, <laughs> we did it in the States, so it's coming, China, India, there are so many countries following this trend. It's a global trend. And we just can't afford it as a planet because we would need three planets to afford this trend. And we clearly need alternatives such as Earth. So I'm, I'm trying really to advocate less concrete, more Earth all around wherever I am. And, and it's one of the Fridays for Future um, demonstrations that uh, Greta Thunberg started. And the picture on the, on the right side is in Ghana, where we also just started the project. And what you see here laid out in this very grid-like pattern um, is the master plan that I got from Ghana. The project is for Don Bosco, for the Salesians in Ghana. And, and I literally took those, those mud blocks and, and and transformed them into more vernacular shapes because you know that the reality around is all these beautiful um, mud huts and 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 I think it's a, a fantastic cultural richness and that works those spaces work and it would be such a loss you know to to lose this cultural um, component and and richness and just you know lining up our buildings in in a grid system just because we don't know what to do else and just because you know colonial uh, colonial times has, has taught us that pattern and i think we need to go also rethink those kind of patterns a lot so this is what would you see when you walk around really beautiful vernacular shapes and this is the final master plan and we were actually hoping to get started today with with that building but because there was just election yesterday, we have to postpone it a bit because there are a little bit of unrest, but we hope to, to start very soon. And this is a campus for education. So we would have like um, agricultural school, electrical training school, school for sustainable construction, then a workshop for, for women related issues and the community hall library and so on. And here the hostel for the girls and the boys teacher unit and some volunteer um, houses as well. Yeah, this was the, is the way how I'm designing. So I'm always designing things on large clay models. I call it clay storming. It's always a very intuitive process. This will be the school for, for construction techniques. And the ideas are coming where are influenced a lot by the Kente weaving textiles in Ghana, which have this very rhythmic 
straight structures um, or, or pattern. Uh, yeah, very, very straight um, rhythmic and then infilled always with sorts of ornaments. So we, we have this straight columns in a way that are not in following a grid again, but like a, like a very intuitive rhythmic. And then the windows coming in as, as ornaments, as playful ornaments in between. And the roof is also following the, a bit the, the hilly landscape. Whenever I'm designing, I'm always trying to, to design in a way, you know, that I'm keeping this question in my mind times 7 billion, you know, how would the world look like when everyone is taking now this decision, this design decision? So I, I, I really believe the world is not changing with one big decision. The world is changing with the small decisions, like, you know, which kind of insulation material am I using? Which kind of paint am, am I using? You know, am I using a mud wall? Am I using a concrete wall or a brick wall? So, you know, it might maybe just a very small decision, but if you multiply it, if everyone is taking this decision by that, so by 7 billion, then, it's, you know, you would see the effect it had on the environment and on the society. You know, where would the money go? Where would the profit end up? So this is something I'm always keeping in my mind and I'm very much trying to work the same way as I do in, 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 in Bangladesh, for example, also in, in Austria, Germany. So this is an interior um, project I did together with Martin Rauch. It's a company building, um, it's acting globally. And they have in the headquarters in Austria, they wanted to have, um, yeah, they also sponsored the Deshi building, for example, and the kindergarten in Zimbabwe that I built. And they wanted to have a little bit of that feeling from that project and from that continent um, in their own headquarters in, in Austria. So we wanted to do the test, you know, how to use very simple building techniques like taking the wet clay and shaping it with your own hands into the European context and, and what would be the differences. So we did just the same thing only in a two-story way. That's my daughter. So she also very much enjoys it to be on site. And we built up the structure in, in you know, we, we did several, several um, elements. So we have a, a two-story monolithic structure. It's, it's like a very introverted space that is also very organically shaped. Also, you know, um, with hand uh, doing the plastering. So you really see that the traces of the fingers and it's following really very fluid spaces. Then you have a, a chimney in the middle that brings the light in with a lot of um, glass windows that we also did ourselves. And of course, beautiful pillowcases, cushion cases from Dipshika, from Dipti Textiles. And that's the, the ground floor. It's like warmth like um, atmosphere inside. And then we also have the Zeppelin, which is a kind of a, a meeting room that is hanging from the ceiling and it's it's the upholstery or the, the cladding of the silk is done with um, non-violent silk from a leprosy project in India. The inside is again mud and the pillows from the, the textiles from our women's cooperative that from the Ananda Loy building. And that's a way we also that we used um, clay in a, in a non in, in not in a load bearing way, but just as plastering on the walls. And I think that's also you know, you cannot build, not always have to build a new building. Um, you know, we have so much existing infrastructure standing around that are in a bad shape and needs some uplifting and upcycling. So you could do that easily with, with a good, with a good and, and beautiful looking clay plastering that is also kind of the humidifier and, you know, balancing the indoor humidity perfectly in your homes. So we did several walls there. And this is a project that I'm doing now in Germany, in Bavaria, close to my hometown for the Catholic Church. The central part is a ramped earth building, a center for sustainability. And this is a timber structure, a boarding school for, for boys. And this is a, an entire mud village. It's an eco-resort project, an, an ecotourism eco project with um, permaculture. And this is a birth space. That's the last building that got finished um, that I did together with Anka Dürr and Martin Rauch and Sabrina Summer. Um, and it's, it's a space that was 
um, that is for, 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 for women to go in to give birth to the babies because it's like, you know, we have spaces for everything, but we don't have a space for, for giving birth, which is kind of really a blind spot in, in, our, design, in our design parts at the ground floor. So, and we were just wondering how it is, you know, I mean, you come out as a child out of the mother's womb and then you come normally, we are in a hospital and then you come, you know, in this, in this bright light and it's just, you know, it's not the most relaxing way to, 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 to start your life. It's quite, rather stressful. So we thought, you know, how could it be different? And this is now, of course, just a prototype that should spark the, the, the interest in this topic and, and, and the discussions around it. And so it is also a workshop space surrounded by a, a, a garden with healing plants. And this is how the construction was. So we built this whole thing with adobe bricks, prefabricated it, brought it to the site, to a beautiful site, and then um, covered this mud, mud uh, structure with a lot of wooden shindles. That looks very organic, like a, like a hen, like a chicken hen that is breeding and highly due. That was the opening. And the last project I want to show is something where I really tried to bring the lessons that I learned in Bangladesh to the European context. And for me, what I learned most is that is also that the building is just the, the outcome. You know, the building is just as important as the process itself. You know, designing the process, there's a lot of power how to create a good community in lies in the process, in this building together. And that is a 1000 year old cathedral in Germany in, in Worms, which is a very historic place. And the surrounding is done by, the interior is done by, by Balthasar Neumann, who is really um, a very famous Baroque architect in Germany. So to step in these footsteps was quite, an, quite a challenge and the task took so long to, to create this, this um, this altar, because every priest just, you know, didn't want to touch the topic. It was just passed. The task was passed from one priest to the other, from one generation to the other. They just had a temporary um, table there. But for the 1000 year old birthday, they thought, you know, this is an appropriate birthday gift. So we said, we're not going to design, you know, it was a competition. Of course, a lot of famous um, sculptures took part in we said we, we went a different way. We said we're not bringing a beautiful object ready made and just plop it in. We're bringing the material and then the community comes together and, and builds the altar itself because it's, a, a, you know, it's a symbol. The altar is, is the, a table where the community gathers around to celebrate and that we thought it's, it's just wonderful to, to do it together. So the Alta was really the, and the kind of the sacred space was turned into a construction site and everyone participated from the kindergarten kids to the to the choir to the Dominican Dominicanian monks that were singing in Latin while ramming to the priest of course and we also in, inserted some historical elements from the Roman Empire but then suddenly people were bringing in the personal memories you know the best wine a songbook a necklace that had special memories. So all that got into this, into this altar and was preserved. And of course the kids had enormously fun in, in mixing the mud and then ramming and stomping the layer with their own feet while singing. And then the moment came, you know, when, when, when we saw the final product of our work, but you know, normally that's the most important part as an architect, when you see, you know, after long work, you see the product. And for me in that moment, it was not so important anymore because I knew, you know, nothing can happen because, you know, the result, the community spirit was already so strong there. And that was such a beautiful gift already. And that was the moment where we just in, all enjoyed to have our baby done. And that is how it looks. It's enormous, it, you know, the moment it was, the shuttering was gone and was this was kind of removed. We just thought yeah, it could have, it could have been there since eternity. You know, it looks there as if it was there for, since a long time already. And that's the power of the earth because it's so archaic. The moment it's there, you think, you know, it could have been there for, for a very long time already. And Alpha and Omega, that's for me a symbol that is very important. You know, we, we architects are always in love with the Alpha. But if we really want to, to, 
to um, build sustainable and build in harmony with nature, we also have to deal with the omega. You know, it's just part of, of that. The end is part and the decay, but it also brings then enables the new beginning afterwards again. So the circle of life is something that we we have to accept much more. And you know, it's for for us, it's sometimes, you know, death and 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 all sorts of, of sicknesses is, is something, you know, we don't want to talk. It's such a taboo in, in, in our society. But I think, you know, this fear we have to, we have to embrace somehow. And there, you know, when we embrace this, then there's also the coming, the new beginning afterwards again. And I think this is something we really have to, to embrace that, you know, just it's, it's part of life. And we are part of, of nature as well. And, and we have to embrace us with all our vulnerability as well. And that's just part of life and it's beautiful like that. Yeah, I'm coming to the end of my lecture. I think if we all just would build with more natural building materials that we all find just under our feet and just all around, I'm really convinced that our workspaces, our homes, our villages, our cities would not just be more healthy and more sustainable, but also more humane and beautiful. Thank you. Anna, we are deeply in debt. Uh, that was an extraordinary experience, really extraordinary. Thank you. I know I speak for everyone that um, we are all moved and energized and excited and uh, feel so much smarter than we were an hour ago. So we are, we are deeply grateful. Thank so, you, Mari. So let's bring in our panel and we have some questions coming from the audience. Uh, and we have some that have ended up in chat, but I think we'll start with, with this. Let's introduce our panel first. And I want to um, especially welcome our Bangladeshi participants um, who are actually Anna's collaborators, but also her client. Um, and, and an organization that she has had a relationship with since she did an internship there, essentially, um, which is, you know, a story we are deeply devoted to interns. And it's very important for people to understand that there are ripples of, um, you know, life's opportunities that can be born of those moments. So um, we're very, very pleased. So let's let's introduce our panelists and our, our marvelous partner, uh, Digital Eyes Film, PJ Moynihan, uh, can make everybody live here so that we can see them. And our deep gratitude to PJ for always um, making these events seamless. Shall we begin? Ah, namaskar. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Anna, um, Anna actually is is blessed with some ling linguistic skills here in terms of introducing the group. So I may defer to you for introducing the um, extraordinary group of folks that we have from um, from the from from Dipshaka, which is the the partner, the longtime partner that has really helped you to realize a way of being a designer that is um, so critically important to share today. So um, I'm going to defer to you to introduce with appropriate um, pronunciation, our colleagues from Dipshaka. Um, so why don't we do that now? Can we take them off uh, mute? Yes. <laughs> so Namaskar uh, Jagadish Jagadish Roy, you have, to, you have to switch on your, your microphone. Did Microphone. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Uh... <laughs> okay. And then, so this was the, 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 the CEO of Dipshika. And then we have Johnny here, who is the therapist, along with Shubo. Can you wave, Johnny, that people know that it's you? So a very <laughs> devoted <laughs> person okay. types of people with disabilities. Yes, Johnny, please say something. <laughs> I think at first Shubo says something about yes. uh, our after that I okay Shubo, Bolo. <laughs> it's very late now in Bangladesh. Onegra toy, I guess, I know. 
You do you do you do you do of joy this building this building may met 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 of mud mud and bamboo. Oh thank this, you that was uh, wonderful on <laughs> Xunda <laughs> there are, there are, the ramp and the toilet, yes. <laughs> I was hoping that this is a big easiness. <laughs> it's good to hear, Shuba. Thank you. Is about disability therapy center. The therapy. I'm happy Physi that you like physiotherapy exercise. Free exercise, busy exercise, cycling, um, symbol. Thank you, Shobo. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, Wonderful feedback. Yeah, I hope now you get your answer. Ki what is the benefit of your building? Yes. For a special uh, needed person. So I hope ki everyone have the same reaction uh, in their own language. They are not expressive all time. Ki, you know the language is the big problem. Ki you, are, you know you're in English or Bengali <laughs> and you know about more than uh, the Rudrapur. In this condition to that, con that condition to this condition. So now our building, uh, Anandoloi. So I hope this is the symbolic building. In Bangladesh, even CRP person are uh, agree with us. CRP, the Bangladesh uh, iconic uh, uh, disabled building, disabled uh, organization. One of the pioneer organization in Bangladesh, this is the CRP. And their person are also agree with us that this is the 100% disabled accessible building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. There, a few days ago, one team came in here for accessibility audit training. So they, they came our building, we just, uh, they gave some training about the accessibility. So our building is accessible. Mm -hmm. Our building, their environment, their ventilation, everything. Especially they are very uh, impressed at the ramp, around the ramp. They thinking ke, we just two or three ramp, the one is I shape, one is L shape and one is U shape. But what is the around? They are in, in front of this and the first floor or second floor, so first floor. So this is the, I think uh, this building is the uh, symbolic icon in Bangladesh for the disabled person. So everyone, uh, I hope uh, many people are came in here and everyone agree this. Yes, this is one of the building is accessible for all person. And That's second, our therapy service, and uh, you know okay, our objective, therapy service, education material, their uh, awareness, even their income generating. So all over thinking that disabled people came in here and they feel, you know, this is the building for us. And I hope that uh, the developing is now started, the transformation started, and I hope it will be increasing and get, you know, its development take time. So this is our starting. I hope the building, your thinking and Deep Shikha work capable work. Deep Shikha, you know, Deep Shikha are working more, more and more time for the developing for the Rudrapur or many other area. So you are, uh, partner or you actually you are not partner you are a family member this yes, is a family <laughs> member ah, yeah thank you very much Johnny, thank you very much <laughs> oh, <Je> thank you. <laughs>
And Mr. Jagadish Vorai is yeah. the executive director of, of yeah. Dhaka. Would you talk to us about this experience? Yeah, I am, uh, you're listening to this. Uh, I am Jagadish Vorai. Uh, basically, I am from the same village that where the, the, uh, the building has been constructed, uh, Rudrapur, uh, the northern part of Bangladesh. Uh, I think it is uh, near uh, 500 uh, kilometers away from Dhaka city. Yeah, very northern part of Bangladesh, very near to India. Himalaya, and uh, I think uh, the, the, the Dipshika is a local organization at NGOs, we say, and uh, working for the rural people in the remote areas like Rudrapur. And uh, the, we have uh, constructed our centers and located in Rudrapur. And mostly, very often, people criticize us that why you are establishing this center like a comfortable center uh, in the rural areas, remote areas, why not the town? Where we, the people can easily come to you, but 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 our motions, our our aims mm -hmm. is there to come to the remote people and stay with them and work with them for their development. Not coming to the town and mm -hmm. not uh, doing for the uh, interest of the uh, people, those who are uh, leading the society in in upper classes. We are basically all the efforts we are providing for the people, those who are coming from the rural area. That's why I think the building, what uh, I, I love to extend my uh, sincere thanks to Anna. Uh, she, uh, she very uh, clearly explained the, the, the building and the architectural uh, designs and whatever uh, has been uh, pro uh, established in Ananda. Alloy. As you already mentioned that Ananda means pleasure, uh, alloy means the house. Uh, it, it means, Ananda means that uh, the, the house of pleasure, mm -hmm. and and I think that uh, by, by the word it it is uh, taking place in the practically it has been it will be taken place. Uh, you see that uh, uh, just a few moments ago we heard from that uh, children with disabilities that uh, everything is there, very accessible uh, for them to to come to the center and to take, uh, receive the services from their physiotherapy service. Uh, then the other 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 uh, service like tricycle is there. They are giving uh, taking the, uh, the service over there, and I think the the building is quite friendly to the children with disabilities and the person with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Not only having the ramp, but but also the other instruments and also the room arrangement and design. Uh, and we, we have seen in the, the presentation of the Anna that there is very small small place over there where the children with disabilities can played over there, enjoyed uh, the room over there, and also at, at, at the same time, uh, received their uh, rehabilitation service, I mean, uh, therapeutic service or language service service or sensory services over there as per need of the children with disabilities. I think uh, we, 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 are, we, are, we are looking for the sustainable development, but, mm -hmm. but it depends on you on how you are looking to the, to, into it. You see that uh, if we look back uh, 50 years, uh, uh, back, then uh, we, we, we realized that uh, at the time, 60-70% uh, of the house was made of mud. But now it is changing as because of, because uh, now the people have some money, they are, they are thinking about their sustainability, but what sustainability we are looking for? Is it Anna explained very nicely that the, we, are, we are people that we are, we are uh, using to have our uh, uh, concrete building like uh, red bricks and cements and then and, and the iron this is the building we are looking for and people is doing over there this is the we are saying that this is the sustainable development but what kind of sustainable development as as Anna said the money where is the money going to only few bricks filled uh, uh, owner getting the money most of the money and the cement factories they are they are taking the money we are look, we are saying that this is a sustainable development. So we are saying that it depends on how we are looking into this, into the into the main thing. I think that people are away the the own mud house as because of this is not long -dibble. Long longevity is very poor. Maybe after every ten years you have to repair the mud house. That's why people is giving away. But that technology what we have used in the Anandala. This is very important uh, to to really to moving towards the sustainable development. 
if we introduce that technology that the marks you just make some straw and marks and mixing it if we do this and also the bamboo if we make a treatment some uh, just just uh, making some treatment over there which is technology has been used in the anandala so that bamboo is not uh, destroying short time it is it is lasting so many years and in this uh, technology if we introduce and we advise the people that uh, let us have such a mat house with with uh, with uh, technology whatever you have used in Dharnamda. Then building will be so longer. I think that people will be convinced and they will they will also take to take the initiative to have some such uh, mud building. This will be really sustainable development I would say. And uh, Dipshiga is moving towards the sustainable development of the people in the, living in the remote areas and and I think that the uh, the, the uh, architectural design and, and the technology, whatever introduced by Anna, we are very grateful to her that uh, this, is a, this is a real step to have the sustainable development. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, I would like to uh, uh, thank our, our partner from Hong Kong, the Sabori Charitable Foundation. Mm-hmm. They're also uh, 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 providing a support for doing something for the personal disabilities. And this is the project that is supported by the Sabori Foundation. And uh, by, under this project, we have had the chance to uh, establish a uh, very natural building and very uh, uh, environment friendly building, I would say, and, uh, as well as the very sustainable building. It is uh, lasting long, uh, very many years. That's why it is, it is a great step, and, and the step is, is, is looking so uh, handsome building. Uh, people cannot uh, think that uh, with such a indigenous material, this building will be so looking so handsome and also long lasting. It is really very impressive. It is really very impressive and really sustainable development. One is still sustainable development. Thank you very much, Anna, for Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, good architecture always needs a good client and a visionary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank and you very much. Yeah. Good model. Um, uh, it's the proof of concept. Uh, we have one other yeah. member of the Bangladeshi team, and that is uh, Chopin. Yeah. Uh, are you actually, can you put yourself on video and unmute yourself? Yeah, Chopin, Babu, please. Chopin, is, is, is he? Chopin? No. Yeah. Well, he figures that out. Um, oh, there he is. Okay. Yes. Ah, yeah. Some of you. Yes. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome. Greetings well. to all. Yes. Greetings to all from the from my side, and uh, I am Shopan Shah, uh, director program. And mm-hmm. first, I like to give thanks to ACD, especially Bellary, for giving me opportunity for this session. Uh, actually, we are very happy. As a Deepshika, we feel proud because we are attending this uh, uh, session. And, uh, and also uh, grateful to Anna because uh, due to her, uh, we, we get opportunity to participate here. Oh. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we have many questions from our from our audience. Um, so stay yeah. with us, stay on camera. Yes. We have one yeah, more sure. person to introduce, and that is Ikam Uda Afa, who is our uh, partner in Nigeria in Lagos, and um, yes. he is an architect with a new NGO with a big yeah. vision on inclusive design. And this is a wonderful story to inspire him. I want to also thank him that we have a number of partners in Africa joining us today. So this is a very important uh, story to share uh, in Africa. So um, Ikam, Ikam you, know, what, you want to introduce yourself a bit? Hey, uh, okay, we are, my, my name is Ekom. And uh, I run the Universal Design Initiative for Africa, and, and basically we're focused on creating an inclusive Africa. And really, um, looking at what um, Anna has done in in Bangladesh, it's really amazing. Uh, it's funny how we have so much potential, and in Africa, I mean, we have a lot of raw material that we're stepping on, and we don't use, you know, and uh, we we love to you know take from the western culture of 
concrete and cement and steel. And, um, you know, here also, we don't even pay attention to you know, uh, inclusive design. And so it's, it's looking at this and how, what is possible, the rationale and, you know, the effect it has created in, in the community. It's amazing, you know, bringing people together, um, doing the, the, the communities doing it themselves. I mean, I love, I love the work. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> so, so much, so rich, so rich. Thank so, you so much, Anna. Okay, we're going to take some questions from the audience and all of the panelists are welcome to chime in. Um, we have a very diverse audience and so the questions are extremely diverse. We have some people who are asking extremely detailed questions and we may not be able to get to all of that. But let me begin. Um, people are wondering how long did these projects take um, because they are so participatory. Can you share with us how long did Anandaloy take, for example? Oh, that was very particular because in that yeah. building, unlike the other building, I was not there on the site and it was entirely built by the villagers. And that was just amazing. You know, it's not an easy structure. It's a very difficult, a specific shape. And it's so impressive that they just handle it on their own. So that was, you know, the Metis school was like four months, like seven days a week. And then we had a drying period and then we had another two months. So the Ananda Loy building was, you know, you always have the rainy season in Bangladesh. So you have to start right after the rainy season in October and you have to finish before May, before the rain is starting. So that's the period that you have and you have to finish. <laughs> yeah. So how long is that, Anna? Huh? What was... What was the actual length of time? So about October, November, December, and then yeah. another five, so eight months. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll hope that that answered the question. Um, and actually, there's been questions, a number of questions about, are about um, how long will the structure last? Does it have a lifespan? <laughs> I'm not God. <laughs> but I think, I think, you know, that the good thing with the mud is, you know, if there's a broken part, you make it wet and you put it back to the wall and it looks like before. So as long as the building is taken care in the sense that, you know, the wall, there is the roof is not leaking and going in the walls. And as long the foundation is good and stable and no water is penetrating from the ground, the mud walls itself can stand really for a long time. I mean, yeah. Like we had to remove some of the, bam the bamboo part in the Meti school because we had no idea in the beginning about the good quality bamboo. You know, that was the biggest mistake probably that I did because I, I thought the green bamboo looked beautiful. You know, we took all the green bamboo and, and you have to take the, the matured one, which is not green. So that was, you know, the thing that you have to learn when you built your first building. But then they had to break parts of the wall as well because you know the bamboo was embedded and the worker said it was like concrete. It was almost unbreakable, the thing. You know, it's like there's a really a maturing process going on and they became very hard. Okay. So thank you. So you, you we'll do have to do something on the mud floors. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have a smooth surface on the plastering, then you have to do we have a good plastering that. And the Deshi building was there, I think, for 10 years. And now, you know, it maybe needs another layer. But, you know, if you use the right techniques, then they can last for a long time. Yeah. The bamboo is a little bit more, more tricky, but the, but the mud walls itself are, are really strong. But uh, now we use uh, palm tree uh, for yes. the next building. <laughs> Good. <laughs> palm tree. Not bamboo and mud, palm tree. <laughs> We, we have a number of people. Next building, good, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a number of people who are asking about weather. So what happens in the rainy season? Is everything fine? Yeah. Question. Yes. So yes. the thing is when clay particles are not stabilized with, with cement, what happens if they're getting wet, they expand and they close all the cracks. So the water <laughs> cannot penetrate deep in the wall. Okay. They also dry out very fast. So what is important that you have the straw because you know it's a little bit rough. So you know when the rain is coming, it's it's stopping. You know the clay particles are stopped at the straw, and then they, you know they, you have a they they kind of uh, they maybe change a little bit the position the clay particles, but the facade itself is strong. You know, and and it's just you know you make the walls maybe two centimeters thicker. Uh, one inch thicker than, than normally and you know that's maybe the thing that will erode within a certain time span but 
the rest, it will remain like this. So one of the other questions is a practical question also related to the structure. What about mosquitoes? Yeah, mosquitoes, yeah, I mean, is, is the problem with mosquitoes? I mean, it's just, yeah, of course it's natural. You know, you, you have a lot of open windows, you don't have air conditioning, so you have, so, but I, you know, I, mosquitoes are mainly there in the night, of course. Okay. Okay, so not well, like, mainly during the daytime. Yeah, okay. that that's helpful. That that because uh, uh, some of our African participants have been asking about mosquitoes, of course. Yeah, I mean, but mosquitoes doesn't depend so much on the building material. You know, it, you would need to have the the the, the net on on the windows, but mm -hmm. then you know, up to now we didn't found it necessary. To, yes, for sleeping you would need to have it, but but so. not for not for daytime use. Yeah. Uh, People are asking. Um, people are asking about um, the ramp and how wide the ramp is. Um, are most people using wheelchairs? Yeah. So wheelchairs, yes. We're going up in the I ramp. Don't, I don't remember exactly, but I think it's about one. <laughs> Johnny, Johnny. Four, four. Johnny. Uh, Anna, I about four, four feet. Four feet. Four. Okay. Four feet. It means, uh, <laughs> quite yeah. enough. U.S. measurement, <laughs> but maybe you remember the video, the first video. So, so it, it's quite quite a, a width. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that people are fascinated by is how much is the end design worked out early on, so that you can talk about the end product and how that much it depends a lot. You know the. The METI school was my diploma project. So I had, you know, I had a year for planning this thing. So it, it was of course an intense time. And then, you know, I had to deliver a finished project as my diploma project. And it did not change so much on the site. It was, was quite, it, it, while the second building, the Deshi building that was not existing at all when we, when we started building. So that was changing a lot, of course. <laughs> I mean, that was, was just organically growing out of the process completely. And then with, with the Ananda Loy building, that was again designed in, in, in Germany. And then, and, and then some detailing, you know, I came two times to the site and then we were just discussing a few details, but the main structure was already existing. So, you know, how to do this poem that is wrapped around the building and, you know, the colors, things, and, and some small details, but the main structure was, was built by that. And I mean, the process was, you know, I'm always trying to, to, to work as archaic as possible, you know, to, to go to the most basic human needs, you know, and, and, and to relate to these patterns like the caves where we just know that people kind of connect with these things. And then of course, there you have this wide, you know, thick walls where you can sit inside and it's always nice you know you have partly the shaded part and then you have the sunny part and 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 we just took elements from all the buildings that worked well from the previous buildings and you know put it inside and and and, and kind of transformed it in 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 a, in a new way and i mean i think the most important part was also i you know i just ask I asked um, a friend of mine who has a daughter with with severe disabilities and, you know, I was just talking to her a lot and she was saying, you know, the most important thing is that it's a beautiful building because mm -hmm. I feel so bad when you when you're living with with someone with disabilities, you're trapped in an ugly world because it may function on a functional level, but all the tools, everything, you know, is so ugly designed. And that's so painful because that's, you know, I mean, it's not uplifting. It's pushing you down the entire time. And it, it's, it, it's just unbelievable that we think that people with, uh, with disabilities have not the senses to see, you know, to, to appreciate this thing. I mean, they're even more, probably more sensitive mm -hmm. towards it because they cannot just change a room if they don't like it so easily. So they, they are not so mobile. So you know, it has to be even more beautiful. And because we were we were working with materials that are very, you know, they are very much relating to the senses, to, to the tactile senses, you know, where you also, 
on a psychological level really feel rooted and kind of grounded and calmed down. I feel it every time when I'm on a construction site with, with working with mod, you know, I'm coming with a very high stress level. And the moment I have, I'm, I'm surrounded with the mod walls <laughs> and I have my hands in the mud, it's like gardening. You just calm down. So that was, I think that was a big part, you know, that we say, okay, we do whatever we can with those natural materials, you know, like tools, like, you know, you have these letters where you can hold on and do some exercises. We have it just uh, with the bamboo, for example. We, so we didn't buy any cold metal pre-existing tools, you know, we just tried to make whatever we could um, with the local materials, because that I think is, is you know, I think that's harming. I mean, if you're really in an ugly surrounding, that's very painful. And, and that was the, the, the main focus that you really, we really have a, a, an, an underloy building with pleasure and joy, where you feel physically well, where you can open up your senses. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. I, I, I think um, for us, we are very attentive to what the neuroscientists tell us about how our brains respond to the environment. And your use of fabric and tactile experience and curves um, are so much a part of what people find to be successful, that make people feel at their best. So our brains are actually telling us what works and we have to learn from uh, what science can tell us now about design that really responds to what's deeply meaningful to us. Uh, I think all of us want one of those places to curl up <laughs> that you have in so many of your buildings. That's a, a particularly appealing idea, particularly where people with disabilities would have the choice to do that or where children could play. Um, really good. People are very wonder, very curious about the materials, of course, and that is a great expertise of yours. So thinking about rainwater and how do you manage the rainwater because you get heavy rains in Bangladesh for part of the year. So how is, has the building you've been able to design to be able to manage that. You don't end up with, with serious water infiltration or um, flooding. No, I mean, as long as, as the pipes and everything are working, <laughs> it's fine. But the water is kind of channeled in the middle. And then we have, we just took a lot of buckets, you know, with holes, they yeah. just yeah. go into each other. So it's kind of a, it's a yellow moving kind of snake when the rain is coming. Is that your pipe? That's your rain pipe? The bucket yeah. of balls? Very yeah. nice. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's a detail we didn't have. <laughs> okay. uh, let me just, um, and, and there's a lot of architects on here. They want to know, well, how, how does the foundation work for all of this flexible construction? What's the baseline of your foundation for most of these buildings that, you know, that's the, that's the base. How does that work? Yeah. So that's the part, the only part where the mud is not suitable. So we are, you can choose between stones that we don't have in Bangladesh, or you can go for concrete or you can go for brick. So we decided to go for, for brick because, you know, if you have to dismantle the building, then at least you can reuse the bricks, but the concrete is much more difficult to recycle, you know. So we, we chose, chose the, the material that we thought is, is easier in the recycling process but that's the part you know where where you cannot have mud but on top of it you know you we just we have a bitumen sheet and then we go with the mud so water of course is important that that that's very helpful i'm sure that people will be grateful to have that detail um yes, a very good book of my colleague martin rauch it's called refined earth there are a lot of details and earth and structures you know how to make a ring beam and all sorts of, of Details, if you're interested in construction details, I would recommend this book. It's Detail um, Publishers and it's called um, Refined Earth, Martin Rauch. We'll, we'll actually add it to our website for this event so people will find it easily. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, one of the things that I, I want, uh, uh, Johnny, because uh, when he, we met yesterday to prepare for today, one of the things that was a wonderful reminder about Ananda Loy is that people with disabilities, particularly mobility disabilities, had never been on the second story before and have a view of the beautiful environment around the building, the woods, the forest, and the, the land. Um, and that was just a, that was a, a very sweet insight as to what that ramp did for people. It wasn't just a practical need, it was also an opportunity to have a different sense of the world. 
yeah this building is uh, very uh, yes the disabled people actually uh, in rudrapur after that the project or the building deepshika is the first organization who are started work with disabled mm -hmm. this is the first organization no or no any organization or work with them so deepshika is the first organization mm -hmm. so when this time we complete the building uh, first we are uh, awareness meeting or uh, giving therapy in a community level but after that they complete the building the uh, complete building and we decorate the building so a uh, few disabler came our building so first time they using their uh, easy to uh, intern the intern is very easy and secondly their environment uh, their accessibility so they like very much it is very easy even our uh, window is very uh, window level is very low because they are easy to open uh, their uh, switch their electric switch is less easy to on easy to off so and their uh, playground even their uh, uh, the oh, area and the accessibility they like very much and uh, second thing ki even uh, any other any government area have no uh, space or no accessible mm -hmm. no accessible but they are easily to move anywhere in the building mm -hmm. the room their therapy room their washroom their teaching room very easy to move so, so they think in building for us so one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to everywhere in the world has to do yeah. with inclusive design and toilets so we had no pictures of toilets but we need to know more about toilets what has been your answer because it's a big challenge uh, <clears throat> everywhere especially for people with disabilities so what is the toilet story yeah toilet story uh, if you uh, if in in area the toilet is a uh, not accessible for everyone if she is physical disabled so he used open place or any other place because they not accessible they are not able to see the proper way okay. they not able to uh, any uh, support to uh, uh, grip this he support for him so but this area the easy to came they have uh, accessible commode or they are uh, uh, supporting uh, aid in the uh, toilet so they are easy to very use so thus if he if he need support said so he just use the supporting uh, supporting thing if he uh, is he, uh, very uh, comfortable to commode so he use you or she use the commode very easily so this is the thing okay i am very easy to use my personal work and they are uh, uh, knock yeah, we have uh, two or three lock in bathroom ki if he is height less so she usually very easy so these things are very accessible for them and say oh it's very easy to open is very easy to close so these thing they are very like they like very much ki it's very comfortably they use it so normally the latrines in bangladesh are you know a hole in the ground and then two footsteps yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also there is no bathroom so we also included a shower you know that they oh. because um you normally take it's a bucket shower that you do normally and um you know it's very i mean th there is no wall around it's the it's the you know it's it's the open place so you know there we also built the shower that in case you know there are people that need help and you know you can take off the clothes and and you don't you don't do it in front of public you know you have some some privacy i think that was also mm -hmm. an important step and and it's really i mean the toilet it's true i mean there is it's it's important to have ways to choose and 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 it, that's a big step i think because normally you have just these latrines things you also don't have a flush so mm -hmm. it's this is um you know this is much more difficult if you're physically mm -hmm. Uh, challenged and we need better even for healthy people you know to, to sit that way you know <laughs> it's even for healthy yeah. you have to have good muscles to do that <laughs> that's right that's right um uh ekom uh, you have listened to a great deal today and you are trying to drive 
um, a lot of attention and energy to the role of design as a civil right or a human right um, in Africa. Do you have, a, let, let me just give you a chance to ask a question. How does this, uh, you're trying to figure out a first model in, in Nigeria for your NGO. Does your thinking so, change today? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm really excited about um, the perspective you know, to which Anna approaches design, um, particularly thinking about how to improve the lives of people, not just um, you know the, the effect of the building on the users, uh, the, from both economically, socially, uh, uh, physically, the environment. And so how can, I, I'm, I'm, it got me thinking, how can I improve people's lives with my skill? You know, how can I um, do something different? You know, it's not just about making a name or being famous. Of course, we see how fame has come already with a design that is inclusive. And, you know, but, but the, 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 what she went out as was, you know, uh, creating a, a sustainable building, creating a building that, you know, but the particip participatory aspect of, you know, getting people to work together. That was amazing. And so I think my question is, is how, how did you get people with disabilities to work with you on the project? Because I know, I know they had a lot to do with the design. Um, how did they influence the design? You know, we, that, when I'm designing, I'm just trying to get, you know, free of any thoughts of any ego, whatever, like really make myself completely free. And I'm just trying to be a vessel and get the intuition in and in my hands and, and designing the thing, you know, it's like, I'm just hoping that I'm finding this, the, the right solution for that. So I, I was not particularly designing for, you know, guidelines and I did not have anything in mind like this. That's the good thing, you know, because I'm not a, yes, I'm from Germany, but I don't know all these rules and regulations. I never want to know because I think they're just <laughs> stuff. So I was just, you know, my, I was just hoping that I'm, I'm, designing a building that just meets the needs and dreams. And we, of course, the things with toilet and accessibility, that is kind of something that is, is easy to imagine. And the rest was just really intuitive. And that's the thing when you're, when, when you're not there and I couldn't be there um, for the designing, you just hope that you're, you're lucky that, you know, so you're not, your intuition is not disturbed and you get the right things in, in the process. And then of course, I know that when things are wrong, you know, we had it with other buildings, you know, that, that then Dipshika is interfering and saying, hey, you know, we need something different. And, and then of course, the, the good thing is um, with mod is, is also patient material. And remember that in, in, in the Deshi building, we wanted to have a storage room and first it was decided it has no windows because then it's more safe and so. And then suddenly we thought, mm, actually it could also be a nice office room. And then we just made a window in, you know, we just put some water and then we took the window in. It's not possible that easily with any other material. So you can actually really change things. And, and we are growing, I, I would say like, you know, you start with something and then you grow into a building and it's probably also changing as well and adopting a bit, you know, and, and, um, but we never see it as a completely rigid thing. It's, it's an organic thing. And if things are not right, we change it afterwards. And that's, you know, it takes time, it takes labor, but it's also creating jobs and it takes water and mud. <laughs> Anna, I think one of the things that many of us uh, really enjoyed were the stories about the role of women, um, yeah. the women as, as participants in, in construction and, and then the textile business actually being brought into a beautiful space. Talk to us about Yes, please, can I say something about the textiles? We're starting our Christmas campaign and hopefully tomorrow, day after tomorrow. And we would be very happy if you start shopping a bit and have a fairy Christmas in the sense of a fair Christmas. So you get some beautiful colors from Bangladesh and, and you support a wonderful 
living conditions for 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 the women there we would be really very happy if, well, if you, I think you you've got us very excited about seeing the textiles that we've seen so if there's something that we can, if there's something we can buy i think a lot of us are going to be very interested you 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 send the url and i'll make sure everybody gets it thank you thank you do we have the women the women is something that really need a support it's um and the, the beginning we started it differently, you know, this, this project started many years ago and we, the original idea was that we said, you know, um, women go to come to Dipshika, they take the silk, they take the thread and, and the design and then they go home and, and do the work whenever they want, you know, according to their schedule, completely decentralized, take a break whenever they need to care for the children and so on. But then we figured out that the, the women so much enjoy it to go to work. <laughs> To have a workplace it's you know it's also dignity to say you know i'm to, to the husband you know gotta go to work <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true and, yeah. and they enjoy talking while they work a lot you know there's a lot of chatting going on and we of course don't have like this time pressure that they have normally in factories and so mm -hmm. so it's very much a project also you know of sharing and also to to kind of um, cross boundaries. Like for example, last time I was there in Bangladesh, it was last year, October, it was the Durga Puja, which is the main Hindu festival. And there's a lot of dancing going on normally, but normally it's the kids who dance or, or the, the men more, you know, the young, the long boys, but the girls from a certain age, they don't dance anymore. And we also had two widows with us in the team and widows also are not supposed to dance. They, you know, they, um, they are quite having a difficult situation in the society and I we were dancing before in the non loy building on the upper floor you know we had music running and we're shaking it off and then then there we were going to to those places where the dance on the stage in front of a few hundred people you know if you have an event in Bangladesh you always have a few hundred people and I could see them how they were like eager to start dancing then I said okay <laughs> let's go and then we went all together on the stage including the widows you know and that's something that is not happening alone you know and they were dancing in front of the hundreds of people in front of their village and the neighboring village and that was just you know such a pride thing, you know, to say, yes, we are there and we are enjoying life and we are proud and, you know, we are self-confident. And that is something that you cannot do as an individual. You have to do it in a group. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, Anna, that's, that's probably the perfect closure to this extraordinary experience that, um, that in the end, uh, you are a designer of joy. Uh, and you've you've yeah. convinced us of that, and your wonderful partners are very much in the heart of that vision of of that idea that all of us together, diverse as possible, um, is the best way to get to that experience of joy. So we are in your debt. Um, we are deeply grateful for our colleagues, um, our new colleagues at Dipshaka, and we very appreciate your generosity for staying up late with us tonight. Uh, to my friend Ekom in, in, in Nigeria with young man with big vision of what's possible. And I think you have confirmed um, what's possible. So our deep thanks. Uh, we, will be, um, we will be making this, this whole presentation available in our ICD um, uh, YouTube. We will caption, make sure our captions are in good shape. Uh, it will probably provide a bit of um, audio description because you have such rich images and we want your voice to be describing those. We may supplement those and come back to you for some clarification, but this is too rich an experience for, uh, for us not to share with a very large group. So we are, we are in your debt. We're very grateful. Uh, we, wish you, um, we wish you great success in, in every adventure that you embark on. And we do hope you'll come back and share those with us. Thank you very much, Valerie. Thank you, Deepshika. Thanks to yeah, Nigeria. Thank you. Yeah. And thank also, you. on behalf of Deepshika, on behalf of Deepshika, we like to invite you all. Please come to us and visit the festival yes. building, uh, accessible building. Please. Thank you. It's open to you all. Please. You're all very tempted. Yeah. <laughs> very, very. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank you. Namaskar, Godavis. Namaskar, Godavis. And I'll see you soon in Bangladesh. Yes, absolutely. That's about, that's about COVID over there. Eh? <laughs>